All right, we are just after seven o'clock here, and we're going to get rolling with this webinar titled Forest and Fire Management in BC Towards Landscape Resilience. We're joined by a great panel tonight. We have Tracy Andrews, who's an RPF Manager for Audits and Investigation for the Forest Practices Board. Tracy is a registered professional forester with over 20 years experience in forest management all over BC, and her favorite projects include collaborating with First Nations and local communities, integrated resource management planning, and investigating special reports for the Forest Practices Board. We've also got Nick Reynolds, who's manager special, for, special projects for the Forest Practices Board. He's a registered professional forester with a master's in sustainable forest management from UBC. For the last 25 years, he's worked for First Nations, industry, government and academia in wildlife biology, silviculture, land use planning, timber supply and forest certification across Canada. We have Bruce Blackwell, who's an RP bio and RPF and a master's of science. Uh, senior consultant, he has more than 33 years experience as a professional forester in biology and biologist, primarily focused in fire and forest ecology, forest management, fire management, wildland, urban interface planning, forest policy, and practice audits and reviews. He's considered a provincial expert in fire and fuels management and has managed numerous projects related to fire risk identification and mitigation. So just like every other one, we will have questions rolling in on our platforms. If you have a question for these uh, guests, please type them in and we will get to them at the end. So this is going to be a fun one. I, I expect some great questions, some great information rolling out. So without further ado, I will turn it over to them. Thanks, Steve. It's going to move this over here. All right. So thanks for joining us today, everybody. We're super excited to be here to talk about this project with you all. I'm speaking to you this evening from the territory of the Euclid First Nation in stormy downtown Euclid. But first a bit about the Forest Practices Board. Who are we? So the Forest Practices Board is BC's independent watchdog on forest practices. We have the authority under the Forest and Range Practices Act and the Wildfire Act to carry out audits, investigate public complaints, initiate special projects, and appeal determinations to the Forest Appeals Commission. Our board includes a board chair, and five appointed board members comprised of experts in their field with a diversity of knowledge and experience. The board is supported by a professional staff, including professional foresters, biologists, engineers and geoscientists, agrologists, and legal counsel. Although the Forest Practices Board is part of the provincial government of BC, the board is independent. It doesn't report to any minister and it doesn't receive its funding from a ministry. The board operates independently, deciding what audits and what special projects it will carry out and what recommendations it makes. The board uses the legislation to fairly and equitably carry out its mandate. Our reports demonstrate our independence, many of which recommend improvements for the government as well as industry. So we started out planning to write a report about landscape fire management but we've quickly realized that in order to be successful at that, there are policy issues that need to be resolved. So we ended up publishing two reports, a special report and a technical bulletin. We're gonna talk about both of those with you tonight. Uh, the special report addresses the need for provincial leadership and a vision to direct and align provincial policies. The technical bulletin speaks to the land managers whose activities have a direct bearing on the health of BC's ecosystems. It summarizes the principles of landscape fire management. All of this work is based on the interviews, experience and knowledge shared with us by the diverse group of more than 30 experts from BC, Alberta and the US Pacific Northwest, including forestry and fire practitioners, social scientists and experts in fire ecology, fire behavior, fire and forest modeling and indigenous fire stewardship. So the chair of the board can choose to do a special report on a topic that is in the public interest. This special report is the first in a series of reports about wildfire that the board's working on. The board chose this topic to move the dial on forest and fire management toward the goal of managing for resilient forests. 
This aligns with the board's strategic priority of encouraging forest and range policies and practices that are adapted to climate change effects and support ecological resilience. So this special report calls on the provincial government to act now and lead BC's transition toward landscape resilience. Achieving this paradigm shift will require a province-wide vision and action plan that aligns policies and programs across all levels of government and integrates landscape fire management into the land management framework in BC. Fire prevention and suppression policies over the past century have resulted in a decline in fire frequency. Today, many landscapes are in a fire deficit. And as a result, the amount of coniferous forest area and dead woody material in the forest has increased. Areas of deciduous forests, meadows, grasslands, and sparsely treed woodlands have diminished. These high fuel loads coupled with the shift from a mosaic landscape to a more homogeneous one has increased the vulnerability of landscapes to uncharacteristically large and high severity wildfires. Forest management approaches have also influenced the pattern and distribution of fuels. Clear cut silviculture systems, reforestation and free growing policies and the elimination of broadcast burning have contributed to the homogeneity of the landscape. These fire and forest management policies also interrupted indigenous fire stewardship. Throughout their history, many indigenous peoples used fire as a tool to manage their lands to achieve a variety of cultural and ecological objectives. Cultural burning was generally applied during low risk conditions such as in the early spring or late fall. Cultural objectives included increasing the abundance of preferred resources such as berries or medicines, forage and game species, or promoting desired landscape conditions such as fuel breaks near communities and contributing to a symbolic and sacred relationship from which humans and nature both benefited from the fire. So look at this, look at how this Washington landscape changed over time due to lack of fire between 1936 and 2012. More recently, the more recent picture, this landscape has fewer meadows and sparsely treed areas, which must, much of the existing forest is dead or dying, contributing to a fire hazard. This California example is similar. This landscape is much more homogeneous now with a more continuous cover of coniferous trees. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, Bruce Blackwell, I'm coming to you from the Tanaha and Sinaikis uh, traditional territories in the Kootenays tonight. Uh, this slide is a provincial analysis of the uh, strategic, it's a strategic threat analysis. It encompasses fuels, um, fire history, spotting capabilities and the urban interface. But really the big message when we look at this image is that as of 2021, when this analysis was done, 45% of public land in BC is at high or extreme wildfire threat. Next slide. Additionally, we know that climate change is increasing the likelihood or probability of wildfire ignitions across all parts of BC. Uh, the BC Wildland Fire Management Strategy reported that the wildfire seasons have been increasing by one to two days per year since 1980, and that climate models indicate that by 2050, summers throughout the province will likely warm by an average of two to three degrees. Comparing these 30 year, this, this graph is a 30 year climate norm with current and future climate projections, it highlights alarming trends in fire weather. Throughout much of BC during the most recent decade, 2011 to, to 2021, uh, we've seen lower precipitation during the fire season, April 1st to September 30th, coupled with increased warm days compared to the climate norms that we've looked at for 19, from 1981 to 2010. 10. These trends constitute contribute to increases in the number of high and extreme fire days, adding up to a longer fire season. So essentially, we're getting more danger days that support ignition and support fire spread. This shows the trend in fire season suppression. This graphic shows the trend in fire season uh, precipitation declining uh, between 1981 and 2021. The next slide 
Uh, please, Nick. It, this illustrates the, ten, the trend in fire weather days over what we classify as the 90th percentile. So only 10% of the fire weather days. And you can see that between 1981 and 2021, that the number of fire weather days is rising and was historically in this uh, region of the province between uh, 10 and 20 days. And it's now rising so it's between 40 and 60 days. So we can see that the fire season is expanding and the, that, that probability and likelihood of higher fire danger, higher uh, uh, fire spread, and, and actually contributing to larger fires, all of this. Um, next slide, Nick, please. So this next slide uh, really summarizes the consequences of catastrophic wildfire and the broad impacts uh, that transcend across economic, health, climate, ecological, and environmental values. And obviously wildfire smoke um, impacts our physical and mental health. And there's been more and more published on that in recent years to the point that it's having a, a really significant impact with the, the long periods of heavy smoke that we're seeing in the valley bottoms during the fire season. Wildfire suppression costs have, have steadily increased over time. Uh, to the point where they're over a billion per year in some fire seasons. The indirect costs from wildfire are two to 30 times higher the direct suppression cost. So in other words, there's a multiplier somewhere between two and 30 times in other costs in terms of losses, health, environmental damages, et cetera. For example, the 2021 wildfire season in BC had direct suppression costs of 800 million and based on that multiplier, the indirect cost could have been up to $24 billion. Forests can, are considered also to be one of the best ways to, to sequester carbon. If we want to make our ecosystems resilient through fire, we need to remove the buildup of fuels that Tracy referred to earlier, and with it, uh, and, and that carbon to cool the landscape. Although the removal of fuels contributes to the short-term release of carbon, that is currently, currently that carbon is stored in the fuel. So the strategy is necessary to mitigate the risk of future catastrophic wildfires, will, which will release much larger amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. The historical fire regimes in BC's ecosystems are based on fuel levels and ecological conditions that could absorb carbon or absorb and re recover after a fire. So they had some level of resilience. However, when we look at the current high fuel loads and changing climate conditions, catastroph catastrophic fires will likely push some ecosystems beyond these recovery thresholds that we're aware of, leading to long and lasting changes. Next slide, please. When we consider risk reduction in BC, we, we've been dealing with fires really on a, on a, on a much more active way since 2003. And really, when we look at wildfire risk, risk reduction, restoration, and climate change adaptation treatments that can reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfires, we know that prescribed burning is proven to mitigate the impacts of extreme wildfire. But over the last 20 years, the use of broadcast burning has actually been declining in BC. Provincial programs have invested in treatments to reduce risk, including mechanical, mechanical and manual fuel removal. And provincial records indicate that since 2018, only approximately 26,000 hectares have been treated within the wildland urban interface, not the broader landscape, uh, at a cost of approximately $72 million. This approach, although well-intended, does not come close to achieving the scale of treatment required to restore the landscape, to restore landscape resilience. We need to shift to a proactive approach to risk management across the broader landscape. Scaling up treatments will be expensive, but will be offset by the reduction in negative consequences that I spoke to in the last slide. Next slide, please. So we need to begin practicing landscape fire management and landscape fire management is part of the solution. Landscape fire management in the context of what we've written in the, this report is an ecosystem-based practice of managing fuels within landscapes, 
to achieve specific objectives such as restoring a mosaic of forest conditions or reducing catastrophic wildfire. And this image is, is, a, is a, a graphic which is meant to portray this landscape fire management concept. Landscape fire management is an integrated in, interdisciplinary approach. It is implemented both through indigenous fire stewardship and an industrial scale integrated into the planning and business cycles of the forest industry, transportation, energy sector, and protected area management. It is not just focused on the timber harvesting land base, it's focused on the whole land base. To help illustrate LFM, imagine a landscape as a box. The edges are areas of low fuel, either human made or natural, that can help to contain or slow wildfires within a specific area. And inside are forests and the many values they provide. Landscape forest management or landscape fire management initially focuses on modifying fire behavior at the edges of the box by treating a small portion of the landscape to affect the size and impact of fires when they occur. Treating the edges is the first step. Really, what we're looking at is a longer term goal of LFM to treat the inside of the box. We've got to start at a, at a large scale and move to smaller scales. We've got to contain these fires within certain landscape boundaries and then work within those landscape boundaries to reduce the overall risk. That includes a distribution of treatments, including fire over time and space to achieve a mosaic of ecosystems that are resilient through fire. The combination of these successional stages and fuel conditions determines the, di the diverse patterns of future fire behavior and severity. Next slide. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I'm Nick Reynolds. I'm joining you um, from Victoria, uh, from the traditional territories of the Lagunquin people. Um, and as Tracy mentioned, we heard from a wide range of wildland fire experts over the course of our project. And many themes came to the surface, including several principles that seemed practical for those implementing landscape fire management. So our technical bulletin was meant to add to the conversation, promoting this integration of forest and fire management in BC. So these are some of the solution oriented ideas that we heard when asking the question, what is landscape fire management and how do we practice it? It starts with defining the landscape. Similar forests or fuel types can span uninterrupted across woodlots, private lands, tree farm licenses, municipal boundaries or protected areas. And wildland fire rarely follows these administrative boundaries. Fire sheds, a term readily used south of the border, are planning units whose boundaries are informed by wildland fire behavior. Fire containment or control features make up the edges, such as natural low fuel like wetlands or water bodies, topographic features like ridgelines or ecological transitions like grasslands or alpine. These boundaries also consider man-made low fuel areas, such as agricultural areas, existing road, rail, or transmission corridors. And they consider technical wildland fire suppression factors like access. These units might range up to the tens of thousands of hectares. Um, they may be nested into or complement existing planning boundaries, such as this example landscape unit, which we're using just for illustration purposes. It doesn't represent any um, formal planning. Um, and this is in BC Southern Interior's humid continental highlands. Defining this landscape is a foundation for cross-boundary collaborative fire planning, helping integrate suppression and prevention activities with common wildfire objectives across jurisdictions and resource sectors. The next principle is to understand the current and projected environmental conditions. So how do we expect wildfire to move through our landscape? What type of fire do we expect? Is it ground, is it surface, is it crown? And how big might these fires be? 
How often might they occur and how fast might they spread and in what direction? These questions have some predictable answers. We can look at past fire patterns, for example. When was the last time an area burned? This illustration shows large fires from the 20s and 40s to 40s, but almost no fires since. We can talk to indigenous stewards and traditional and local knowledge keepers about the role of historic fire. We can look at things like ignition patterns. Where do we expect lightning or human caused ignitions? We can look at fire weather, like Bruce had mentioned, seasonal trends in precipitation uh, or temperature uh, during the fire season or um, things like wind direction patterns. Um, we can also, uh, as Bruce had mentioned, look at local trends in fire danger rating dates. And these are all examples for, from, from this, this area that's mapped. We can also look at climate change models with, with bring insights into how fire weather may change over future decades. Climate, geography, and fire history all provide clues into how, what to expect or how to expect fire behavior to in, in, in our landscape. In BC, we have classifications of natural disturbance types divided into four classes. And for this area illustrated, there's three here. The low-lying areas may have seen frequent stand maintaining fire, ground or surface fire every two to 50 years. And the mid-slope area may have expect um, st frequent stand initiating events, mixed surface or crown fires every 150 years or so. And the highest elevations may have only seen infrequent stand replacing events like crown fires every 200 years or more. These just represent bookends across a gradient of fire severity and frequency that describe a much wider range of potential fire regimes. Understanding fire regimes are important to land managers like foresters because they hold important clues pointing to forest attributes like how patch sizes Biological legacies like coarse woody debris or stand structure or species distribution, how they might differ across these areas and help make the landscapes resilient. We can then look at the, these patterns created by natural disturbances, like the fire example we looked at earlier, but also things like uh, uh, harvest history over time and other land uses. Uh, to see the current patterns of vegetation. This in turn are our fuel types. Canada's forest fire behavior prediction system can be used with our forest inventory data to estimate fuel types. Like this example showing ponderosa pine and Douglas fir fuel types in dark green or deciduous or mixed wood fuel types in light green. These fuel types, along with fire weather topography, can be used by fire behavior specialists to do fire behavior modeling, to estimate things like the rate of spread or head fire intensity. Um, like this head fire intensity model. Um, oops, I lost it. Oops, I lost it. It was a, an example of a head fire intensity model um that shows the expected energy on a fire line based on those fuels and topography so with that in hand the wild the fire behavior modeling in hand be, we can begin to understand the hazards how much the landscape has departed from or is approaching resilience through or to fire the next principle is to understand risks to values where must we minimize adverse effects or where is fire accepted or prescribed even to promote its beneficial effects? There is no currently single comprehensive wildland fire risk framework in, in Canada. In BC, we use a thing called the Resource Sharing Wildfire Allocation Protocol to define, help define priority levels, primarily for suppression response. And this starts with human life and safety, concentrating efforts within two kilometers of a community, and also critical infrastructure like 
communication towers, transmission lines, or pipelines. That makes a lot of sense, but it typically leaves out other values like high cultural or environmental values and other resources um, uh, out of prevention and suppression planning. Landscape fire management extends that beyond the wildland urban interface or RUI to include regionally important values like community watersheds, as shown on this map, traditional use areas or wildlife habitat, old growth forest, or areas of merchantable green timber. Knowing the spatial location of these values and fire behavior modeling, that was the map I was trying to show earlier of head fire intensity, um, that provides us with the consequence and hazard factors used to help determine risk. That <clears throat> can be done through landscape level threat assessment, not unlike this provincial strategic threat assessment or PSTA that the BC Wildfire Service undertakes for the whole province. This is a good input for landscape fire management, but currently focuses on just those first um, resource sharing values like structures. The next is um, having <clears throat> complementing complementary wildland fire objectives. So those objectives are going to be on a gradient of intervention, but they all should consider spatially specific fire behavior outcomes. For example, some areas will require a lot of active risk reduction, such as around communities. This is the area that Bruce and Tracy mentioned earlier, where there's a lot of work ongoing throughout the province through things like plans like community wildfire resiliency plans. But because LFM extends activities, these active risk reductions beyond the interface areas, it would include prevention or restoration for places like community forests or other values mentioned earlier. Other areas could be managed to minimize unplanned fire, limiting potential fire behavior, providing wildfire response decision makers with a broader range of options to minimize adverse effects and maximize the beneficial effects of fire in the landscape. Other areas may emphasize strategies to restore fire to the landscape, um, like they're doing in Banff and Jasper and Yoho, for example, by using historic fire regimes across varying ecoregions as a reference for fire type, size, and frequency of return to calculate an expected annual area burn. These um, uh, this is where the fifth principle really comes in, which is we need to be coordinating this intervention using the skills and expertise of fire management specialists, land managers, including forest tenure holders and professionals to implement objectives across different areas of land use. These wildland fire objectives are implemented using strategies. Some of them are passive or active to meet targets. Passive strategies might include using a modified response which is letting an area, that includes letting an area burn, whereas active strategies might focus on converting fuel to less flammable fuel types, reducing fuel quantities, or isolating fuel, breaking the continuity of fuel through things like conversion or fuel reduction. These active strategies might only occur in limited areas across the landscape where an objective like protection or risk reduction considers fire behavior and also tactical considerations like access. So some strategies might only occur in low fuel corridors such as landscape level fuel breaks that are anchored, accessible and defendable. In areas of high risk where wildfire objectives, um, uh, oh, sorry, with high risk, establishing fire tolerance stands um, uh, may consider lower densities or more fire resistant or resilient species, including deciduous trees. These are species whose rooting habits, branching patterns, bark thickness, 
or their lower levels of volatile compounds and help them make them more resilient to fire. Another related strategy that considers these same species is when we design low flammable retention, particularly in areas like in block reserves. Um, another strategy is managing surface fuel loading. Um, so, and there might be different um, objectives for surface fuel loadings or targets in different, different areas of the landscape. And it might be reached by through mechanical or hand treatments or thinning or targeted harvesting. But this work to reduce fine fuel loads to specific targets, whether inside or adjacent to low fuel corridors, is informed by the fire behavior outcomes we want to reach. And this is done by increasing biomass utilization, piling or piling burning, or through the use of prescribed fire. Um, it, prescribed fire, particularly in treated stands, we've seen in research in the states that have found that the most effective way to reduce surface fuel is a combined approach using mechanical treatments and prescribed fire, which we'll hopefully be seeing more of in BC. Um, two other active strategies to reduce fuels commonly are used in shaded fuel breaks are increasing crown base heights and reducing crown fuel loads. Increasing the height to live crown involves removing ladder fuels. So decreasing the chance of fire spreading from the ground to the crowns to help prevent a crown fire. And reducing crown fuel loads is when the main canopy provides enough continuous fuel for a fire to spread from crown to crown, thinning that overstory may be necessary to lower the risk of an active crown fire. But um, to a level that uh, doesn't expose the stand to too much increased winds or reducing shade so much that it causes surface fuels to dry out and regeneration to increase. Lastly, isolating fuels may take the form of primary or secondary fuel breaks, which may include full vegetation removal, or as discussed earlier, um, shaded fuel breaks. So, these landscape objectives with clear fire behavior outcomes may therefore require things like road locations or a forest cut blocks shape, size, retention, and regeneration to consider things like fire regimes or fuel types, the values at risk or the post-treatment fuel loading. It isn't easy and requires policies to align to help enable landscape fire management. And there are pockets throughout the province where uh, landscape fire management is happening, but it tends to be driven by you know, small um, uh, tenure holders like community forests um, or, or uh, other proponents that keep running up against um, policy barriers. So for example, in the Caribou, where a landscape fire management plan was designed, there was 17,000 hectares uh, of area that was identified for a fuel break. Um, and that plan also highlighted that 30% of the wildland urban interface was zoned for other high values like mule deer winter ranges or old growth management areas that have overlapping uh, uh, objectives. So finally, um, learning from experience is the last thing. Um, landscape fire management, it's iterative, iterative and ongoing. It needs to be periodically updated to recognize changing infrastructure, forest harvest, change in natural disturbance and vegetation growth that affect patterns of fuel over time. And we need to continue calibrating our target fuel management standards with predicted rates of spread and intensity and move away from one-off projects and move more towards programmatic practice. Thanks for that, Nick. Um, so as you can see, we have our work cut out for us. Uh, shifting to management for landscape resilience will not come close to achieving the pace and scale necessary without government leadership and an integrated approach. To achieve the vision of landscape resilience, 
an action plan must address the following outcomes. Number one, to foster public support. Public support is needed to successfully shift to managing for landscape resilience. Currently, many people fear that using fire as a tool will result in smoky skies or a fire that will escape. Some view wildfire risk reduction or restoration treatments as an, just another excuse for licensees to log timber. Number two, we need to align legislation and policy. It is crucial that all levels of government, be it federal, provincial, municipal, indigenous, uh, commit to sharing their responsibility to address catastrophic wildfires in BC. And that they're working towards a common vision. Alignment of provincial legislation and policies should promote coordination and consistencies across jurisdictional boundaries, across ministry mandates, and spanning election cycles. The third is to manage for shifting dynamics. So the public want conservation of certain values such as old growth. At the same time, these very same values are at risk due to climate change and wildfire threat. Conservation of values must involve managing for shifting dynamics on a landscape, which means actively managing those values today and planning to create or recruit more of them in the future somewhere else on the landscape. The fourth is about developing funding models. Wildfire risk reduction treatments can be really costly, as we heard earlier, and there is currently little funding to support landscape level treatments outside the wildland urban interface. The cost of treatments is a significant barrier. Without large and sustained financial support, markets for the residual fiber imposing legal requirements, risk reduction or restoration treatments will not occur. Number five is about achieving scale. So proactive use of prescribed fire allows the land manager to reduce or mitigate the negative impacts of a wildfire and generate the positive benefits of a more benign fire. Treatments at scale require supporting policy, a sustainable funding model and public acceptance. And the sixth outcome that we're hoping for is to build capacity and expertise. So the demand for expertise in landscape fire management and on the ground application of treatments already exists. It's already hard to find people to do the work and will continue to grow. Increasing access to formal education, training and professional development is critical to achieving the scale of landscape fire management required to improve landscape resilience. So California's Wildfire and Forest Resilience Action Plan is a comprehensive example of what BC needs and our report calls for. One key element is that the recommendations in the California Action Plan were developed by the Governor's Forest Management Task Force. The task force is a coalition of resources representing state, federal, local, and tribal governments. Um, and it's supported by a science advisory panel, which is also key. And that panel's role is priority setting, science-based decision-making, and identification of research gaps. So in our special report, the Forest Practices Board recommended the provincial government lead the development and implementation of a vision and action plan for landscape resilience that will align policies and programs across all levels of government to enable landscape fire management to occur. So we want to leave you with the following take home messages. We need leadership, a vision and coordinated and collaborative action. The pace and scale of that action must surpass that of wildfires. We must integrate landscape fire management into the land management framework in BC. And land managers should be considering how the work they're doing today can play a role in implementing landscape fire management. Thanks, everybody. That's, uh, that's our presentation. That was great. Tons and tons of information there. And I fully expect some questions are going to start rolling in. So I'll open them up here. And yep, there they are. So first one is 
I was involved in broadcast burning in the 70s and 80s. I see that there is virtually none being done now. Why was this fuel treatment mode dropped and could we see it coming back? Great question. I'm gonna look to Bruce Blackwell, our most experienced panel member to uh, answer that question. I knew I was gonna get that. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, is, it is a great question. When I started in this business, um, I worked up in the, the Skeena region and in that time in the 80s, we were burning about 500,000 hectares a year. I think the number now is below 10,000 hectares a year. And largely, it, it's a combination of a number of factors. First of all, uh, escape fires in those days were tolerable because there weren't as many values on the landscape. But probably the biggest uh, fundamental thing has been physicians' concern for smoke and the smoke effects on health. Many of the drainages in, in BC are already affected in the winter by accumulations of industrial smoke. And there has been research that has shown that industrial smoke has led to higher incidence of uh, related cancers. And so there's been a very strong and uh, resistant lobby by the physicians in, in BC, and they've successfully restricted smoke. The other thing is there's regulations, venting index, um, timing of burning, and a loss of capacity in people that have the experience. So uh, I, I don't want to pin it on one specific uh, issue, but it's a combination of issues. And somehow we have to overcome this because I always tell people that uh, we need to tolerate a little bit of smoke under co controlled conditions rather than, rather than accepting these large amounts of smoke that are occurring under uncontrolled conditions that last long periods of time during you know, inversions that bring the smoke into our communities and hang in there for weeks at a time. There has to be a change in mindset if we're gonna successfully deal with smoke management. Excellent response. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll grab a question here that's been sent in via Facebook and it says, awesome presentation. I'm keen to hear what each of your responses are to this. What can we as members of the BC Wildlife Federation do to further this mission and vision of the LFM? Good question and thanks for that. Um, you know, I think that from, just from a conservation perspective, uh, we need to be able to create the, uh, the, that dynamic management shift from uh, put a line around it and protect it because we fought incredibly hard to set that area aside for whatever value it might be, be it old growth or ungulate winter range or what have you, and, and recognize that, you know, we either need to actively manage those areas so that they remain healthy and resilient and think about if something does happen, where out, like where can we start recruiting? Like I mentioned in, in the presentation. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that and pass it over to Nick. Um, I think I would just add that, that um, you know, the <clears throat> there's a tendency to um, put the solution of this from a policy point of view. And, and the action onto the, the wildfire service, a branch of the Ministry of Forests. And um, I think if the Wildlife Federation were to echo to the government that in fact, this is a, a much broader um, uh, issue that uh, affects um, you know, all, all the sectors, in, including conservation and species at risk, um, that, um, yeah, that, that might help um, <clears throat> put pressure to, to have a, a, a wider um, task force that includes, um, you know, the, the, the right specialists to advise the government for, for taking action. Yeah, I know, I don't really have a lot to add to what Tracy and Nick have said, I mean, I think the reality of, of what we know from fire science point of view is that land use, and I, I don't wanna just talk about uh, timber, 
because this expands beyond what we would call the timber harvesting land base. It, 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 it crosses all ecosystems, whether they're in parks, whether they're in protected areas, ecological reserves, or the timber harvesting land base. The whole land base has been homogenized by the lack of fire. So in other words, we have ingrowth of fuels that have made stands more similar than the diversity that we had when we had fire on the landscape. And it's that homogeneity that has reduced the ecosystem services of our, our, our ecosystem. It's reduced the quality of wildlife habitat. It's reduced the quality of timber. It's re reduced, it's, it's all of those things are being influenced by the homo homogeneity of the landscape. And that's why it's so fluidly burning. Unless we start to think about a dynamic landscape that has much more variation, variation in species, variation, you know, the, all of these different things, uh, we're not going to be successful in implementing change that's going to be impactful. And I agree, we need experts in wildlife speaking as part of that expert panel to government on the changes that we need to make. Awesome. So that'll roll right into this question here that I've been looking at. Uh, it, it, this can come right to you. Uh, can we mandate instead that burned areas be planted solely with deciduous trees like aspen and birch and get away from monocrops? Is that to me, Tracy? <laughs> uh, it, this is an interesting question. Um, we use an ecological framework to plant trees. Certain sites favor certain species because of their moisture and nutrient regime. And there, there's a, a very strong lobby that we need more deciduous trees. Um, if you fly over a landscape, and I was flying in the Kootenays today, you might get a landscape that has 30 or 40% deciduous. You rarely get, uh, I mean, you get stands pure deciduous, but to create deciduous, solid deciduous stands requires moist nutrient and a, a high moisture regime. So, it is it is it is important that we incorporate more deciduous into the landscape but it isn't the silver bullet to solve all of our fire problems the other thing um about deciduous and you, a lot of people have been men mentioning birch birch actually because of its peeling bark um if you talk to fire people in the fire community that peeling bark that comes off birch birch is the best firewood you can put in your in your in your in your fireplace most people know that when it cures it burns better than any other wood species. So one birch has high flammability, but the second thing is the bark creates embers, lots of embers, and you'll get much more spotting if you have a birch stand compared to an aspen stand. So you, you know what, everybody looks for a silver bullet to our fire problems. I wanna go back to that word heterogeneity because I think that's the important. We don't wanna overplant deciduous now, uh, because we think we've cleansed the landscape of 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 that species. I think I, I agree. There's certain landscapes that need more deciduous, but there are a lot of landscapes that have deciduous, and we have mixed fuel types that burn just as high intensity as we do conifer. Uh, so really, it comes back to how dry are they. So what is the drought? What is the slope? The fire environment? Anything that is wood will burn. Perfect. Quick and easy one here should be anyway. Uh, you, you referenced a couple of studies from the U.S. showing the combined mechanical and prescribed bur burning effectiveness. Can you name them so I can read them? They're in our report, I would suggest as references. And for everybody that's listening to this tonight, I recommend that you read our report because there's a lot more in-depth analysis as it relates to some of these issues. Yeah, yeah, that that in particular um, is in the in the technical bulletin, um, and if you went to the um, technical bulletin uh, under page eleven, you'll see the the references. Thanks for that. Okay, drawing from Nick's example for the caribou, how do we align the mule deer winter range and old growth management area policies to the vision that Tracy? just outlined. Nick, you want to start on that one? Yeah, um, I think it's, uh, 
it's not going to be a one size fits all. Um, as you probably know, the different areas, whether it's mule deer winter range or other winter range or wildlife habitat areas will have specific objectives. Um, and it will require, um, it's really an interdisciplinary approach where we, we have that biologist sit down with the, the, the fire behavior specialist and, and maybe a forester or other practitioners who's involved in, in a fuel uh, management prescription and uh, talking about what's the, what the win-win is. At, at the end of the day, um, there are likely um, a lot of um, uh, forest attributes that uh, are good for wildfire risk reduction, uh, as well as wildlife habitat. It's not one or the other. Um, and, um, and we also have to remember that some of these treatments might only be in small areas like, um, you know, landscape fuel breaks, or, you know, which may include shaded fuel breaks. So those, those have trees on them and have um, structural attributes for, for wildlife. So it, it's, it's absolutely possible um, to, uh, to have these overlapping objectives, although there, there's probably gonna be compromises at, at times. Excellent. Okay. Is there any recognition or effort towards mandating that logging companies clean up their clear cut areas and not leave behind so much trash of unwanted trees after they slash and cut an area? Can we establish legislation that mandates that they both thin out dense groves of conifers every 10 years for everything they own and mandate they clean up the downed lots? Um, I'm going to point to Nick again on this one because he has an ongoing project that is kind of looking at some of this stuff. So Nick, do you want to talk about that? So uh, there, there, there is under the Wildfire Act a requirement for licensees to um, abate fire hazard. Um, unfortunately, um, there's there's not a lot of um, uh, those assessments or often those assessments are, aren't necessarily done. Um, and um, there's, there's lots of room for improvement um, in, in BC, particularly when it comes to uh, <clears throat> reducing the surface fuel loads uh, down to a level where we have a fire behavior outcome that we're happy with or that we want. So in particular, when we think about areas with high risk, like for example, around communities or the, the wildland urban interface, um, there may be a requirement to um, have much lower surface fuel loads. So for example, if you're gonna do mechanical or hand um, treatment or thinning in a stand around those communities, um, in order to get funding, you need to kind of prove that you're reducing the fuel loads and to a certain, you know, level. Um, so that that might be under five tons or under, you know, one ton of of fine fuels per hectare. And um, but that hasn't yet really crossed over to the forest industry for, um, you know, for clear cut or other silviculture systems. Um, it is something that currently the provincial government through the Ministry of Forests is working on uh, a drafting, a regulation under the Forest and Range Practices Act that, um, that actually will set clear targets for post-harvest um, uh, you know, uh, fuels um, left on, on the ground. And so, uh, in a way, uh, government is working towards that, um, but uh, what our report points to is the need to have to set those kinds of targets in different areas across the landscape, so we kind of know what we're aiming for. Uh, 
Excellent. How are you guys doing for time? We're, we've got a bunch of questions and I know you guys uh, are on a, a time limit here. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'll start at the top here. Are there any programs that are designed to benefit private landowners, such as large ranches in the South Okanagan? Bruce, you're probably yeah. our most uh, there. There is. Aware. Yeah, so there has there is a fire smart for farmers and ranches that was developed. Um, I actually worked on that project for several years. If you go to the fire smart website, it will speak to farm and ranch issues, but there is no you can I, you there is no funding available on, unless you go through. I believe the Calvins Association may have some resources to do some evaluation work but in terms of treatment work on on your ranch or farm that's on your you're on your own uh, but there is guidance uh, there's some videos and there's some written resources that you can get um, on the fire smart website as it relates to the ranch and agriculture industry perfect quick and easy uh, are you aware of any of treatment machines such as used in europe like the Hatas limbing machine. This could work great in space stands to eliminate ladder fuels. And then he supplies a YouTube video. That's not anything that I'm aware of, but Bruce may again, or maybe Nick has something to add there. I mean, my only concern is does it actually remove the thin material or does it leave it on the ground? Because if it's leaving it on the ground, it's a yes. fine fuel hazard. And I don't know anything about that machine. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, and I don't know that specific machine either. Um, but uh, one thing that we have heard is in terms of uh, efficiency of doing this work um, and this integration from the, you know, the forest industry and fire management is um, kind of those machines that when, when they're doing thinning treatments that do whole tree removal, um, essentially is, uh, can be the best if the objective is to lower um, uh, fine surface fuels. Perfect. Okay, there's another one here that could be quick, but I'm not sure, <laughs> is your, is your report penetrating the forest landscape planning process that is now underway? Yes, it, I mean, to a certain degree. I mean, the Office of the Chief Forester definitely um, is in tune with it. Um, and I know like we have been contacted by um, some groups that are involved in the forest land with some of the new pilots looking to us to participate in some of their initial sessions. So they're definitely, uh, th this is on the radar screen for sure. Thanks for that. Another one that could be quick. Any engineers you recommend working with? <sighs> I'll pass on that one. <laughs> Me too. Read the report. <sighs> I hey. won't tell you either. <laughs> Okay, let's make this the last one because we're rolling over the time you guys gave us. So, Bruce, you mentioned the LFM should have a distribution of treatment over time and space. How do you see this being implemented inside of the forest landscape planning processes in BC? Well, that's a great question. Um, really, we got to start at the, the scale of the, of the landscape that we're working at. And I think Nick spoke to that in that we're identifying the box. So really we want to keep fire to begin with within that landscape and not have it spread into other landscape units. And then we have to be, begin to tackle it by compartmentalizing it using road corridors, transmission corridors, areas of non-fuel, areas uh, of riparian. So we need to we need to think about what features of the landscape are gonna are or of that study area, we're gonna break it up. And I, I ideally we begin to break it up over time using those broad-based, what we'll call non-fuel or fuel break areas, and then gradually we move to the stand level where we're doing things at the stand level 
that stop individual stands from burning or spreading fire across other parts of the landscape. But it's, you know, we, we've had a hundred plus years of fire suppression. We don't have the resources and we don't have the money to do this all at once. So we've got to start at that higher level planning unit and move down to smaller planning units. The other thing that we're trying to achieve, if we really want to reduce or in, introduce fire into the landscape, we need, we need to make sure that our fires that we prescribe are not going to escape out of the areas that we want to treat. So for example, there was some prescribed fire years ago done by the National Park Service in the US around Los Alamos. They didn't properly reduce the fuel load to accept the prescribed fire. And it turned into um, a tens of millions of dollar fire because it threatened the Los Alamos Research Station. People in parks were uh, removed from their jobs because they didn't recognize the scale of hazard that they were trying to reduce and the implications of trying to burn without these building blocks in place. So that's what I, I can, I mean, every landscape is going to be different. Every landscape will contain features that will uh, either be a conduit for fire or will limit fire spread. We've got to put those building blocks and understand them in place. And then we need to work strategically to reduce those hazardous areas so that we, we can reintroduce fire properly without tearing up the landscape. I think that's an absolutely great way to end this presentation. Thanks everybody for tuning into this. Unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to get through the remaining 20 or so questions just simply based on time. Um, we will be getting this presentation up on our social media for everybody to watch again. You can look through the, the, the presentation they gave. We will link their report as well for you guys to go through as well. If you've got any questions, the contact information is there. And once again, thanks everybody for tuning into this. And thanks Tracy, Nick and Bruce for this wonderful, uh, we'll call it a fireside chat, it works. And uh, we, we look forward to doing this once again with everybody. So thanks again, on behalf of all of us, thanks again. Thanks See for you. having us, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.